I'd like to get started. So I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Glenn Ahrens. I'm the Oregon State University uh, Extension Forester and working in Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River counties. And as you might imagine, we get a lot of questions about dying trees or sick trees. And so uh, with my um, co-worker and assistant, Sarah Cameron, we have organized a series of forest health webinars. And we're starting out um, with this first one on Western Red Cedar. Uh, before we start that, I'm just going to kind of talk about a few housekeeping rules. So we are here on Zoom. This is a Zoom meeting, uh, which means that um, everyone has a chance to uh, talk or turn their video on. Uh, but we want to certainly keep a respectful uh, quiet during the presentation and only turn on your microphone if you're speaking. And since there are going to be quite a few of us on Zoom, um, as we go, you might put any questions that, that occur to you in the chat. Uh, I might consider just putting your questions in the chat and then Sarah and I will be uh, minding that and helping with the questions with Christine. And um, we're going to take an hour for this, so we're going to end at seven o'clock. Uh, there might be a little opportunity to linger a little bit if there's some good questioning still going on, if Christine is willing. I will go ahead and, uh, and get started and introduce Christine. So um, for this one on Western Red Cedar, uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Christine Buell. She's our forest entomologist for Oregon Department of Forestry for the state of Oregon, uh, and but gets involved in almost all things related to tree health, uh, along with her partners um, in that agency and others that we all work together. And Christine uh, has been there, I think I met you back in 2006 or something like that. So you've been around for a while and uh, we're sure glad that you've gotten to know uh, our force and, and all of us here. Uh, so without further ado, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Christine, and I'll get into the background with Sarah to mind the chat. So thank you for being here and take it away. Great, thank you so much, Glenn and Sarah for setting this up. Um, this issue of Western red cedar dieback in the Pacific Northwest is not a new one. Um, Glenn and I have gotten many calls over the years about it. And so um, we developed a research project to try and monitor it and determine what some of the patterns that we're seeing on the landscape to try and determine what the primary cause of that is. As mentioned, I'm the um, state forest entomologist. I work with Oregon Department of Forestry along with a team that includes a pathologist, invasive species specialist, and aerial survey specialist. And we work much like Glenn um, as extension agents typically to try and assist you with diagnosing issues on your landscape, um, insects, disease, abiotic issues, and then trying to give you management guidance going forward. Um, but we also rely on you quite heavily to report to us what you're seeing. And so this issue of Western Red Sea or dieback is something that whenever I start getting um, a lot of calls on a weekly basis about a certain topic, I realized, okay, there's something bigger going on here. And this is one of those things. So this kicked off a project that I'm going to um, talk about today. Um, this is just one picture of kind of a, a center of Western red cedar dieback. Um, this is probably very familiar to a lot of you that have Western red cedar in your immediate area or have driven past areas with Western red cedar that we're seeing it die back commonly in a lot of areas that should host Western red cedar within the known range of Western red cedar. And so um, this is a really important tree. We're really concerned about losing it on our landscape. It's native, um, widespread, um, particularly in the West, down through the Willamette Valley and further in Oregon, and then beyond up into Canada um, and into um, Washington um, and even some parts of Alaska. So really important heritage tree, um, also provides a lot of stream shading, bank stabilization, um, really special species that we hope to retain on the landscape. So going forward from this talk, I hope that you learn where red cedar would not like to be planted so that we don't try to force it where it's not going to do well and try to preserve it where it can do well. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this dieback we're seeing pretty commonly in areas, as I mentioned, that we would expect it to do very well, shaded areas along streams, um, right where it's supposed to be, where it typically is preferred to be. However, some of the climactic conditions in those areas or maybe the quality of the site uh, paired with those conditions has made it more stressful for those trees. So even though we have some larger Western red cedar that have done quite well for many years in those sites, 
Um, they are no longer getting the type of conditions, specifically a type of precipitation or the quantity that they need. And so they are starting to die back. Um, and sometimes it's just a, a little initial sign of stress and then they kind of hang in there and other times they die fairly quickly. Um, so these sites are now becoming somewhat fringe habitat for Western red cedar. So I encourage you when you are planting any species of tree, um, think of it as if you are in a nursery and you are looking at plant tags and trying to determine, is this a plant that prefers shade or full sun? Does it require weekly waterings? Um, or maybe is it more drought tolerant? Pay attention to the species that you're selecting and then what, where you're putting it on your landscape um, what is already doing well there. If you have a bunch of drought tolerant plants doing well there and some plants that are not as drought tolerant not doing well, that's telling you something. So pay attention um, to what these plants actually prefer to give them the um, best shot at persisting in those areas. Um, so uh, what we've been seeing is this dieback within the range, no obvious causes. Um, there wasn't one silver bullet and that's really common with um, most forest health issues that it a complex of issues, either it's drought and insects and disease or storm damage paired with um, other types of stress factors. Um, it, it's rarely one single thing that you go, aha, that's it. Um, but the takeaway, as I'll get to at the very end, is putting the species where it wants to be. And that's how you can head off some of this mortality down the road. So we've noted this dieback without, uh, throughout the range of Western red cedar, and that's that green area noted on the map there. Um, I noticed it really heavily in the Willamette Valley. So that's that red block there in that area. There seems to be a high concentration of Western red cedar dieback. But then in talking with our partners in Washington, they were seeing the same thing also in on the west side, but also they have some western red cedar located on the eastern side of that their state, which is a little bit drier, but some of it's a little bit higher elevation and western red cedar can persist there. Um, versus in Oregon, a lot of our east side is not really hospitable to western red cedar. Um, so we did get reports, not just in Oregon, but also in Washington, um, even in Idaho and Alaska and Canada. Um, and so we started looking into it a little bit more closely, um, forming a partnership between Oregon and Washington to kind of dig into the issue, but also cluing in our partners in Canada and Idaho and Alaska um, for their input as well. These are some of the symptoms that we typically see. Now it does vary from site to site. Sometimes you'll have a mixture of symptoms at one site. And as I mentioned, sometimes these sites or these um, these symptoms take hold very quickly and then the tree dies soon after, sometimes the same year or the next year. Other times you'll see these symptoms kind of start and then maybe they'll take a break um, or the trees kind of hang in there. Um, they've lost some foliage, but then they, they can persist. So it doesn't always mean that your tree is slated to die, at least not yet. Um, so I do offer the idea of perhaps letting some of these trees ride if they are presenting some initial symptoms. You don't have to cut it down immediately if it's not a fall hazard. Um, these trees can still stay upright for a very long time. And even if they do die, um, maybe reducing their height a little bit for uh, retaining them on site for our wildlife habitat. Um, plenty of woodpeckers utilize them for homes. Um, all is not lost. We still are retaining some benefit from keeping even some of these um, stressed or dead trees on site, as long as there's not a wildfire or a fall risk. So the symptoms we typically see are thinning. Um, so the far left, you can see thinning either starting at the very top of the crown or just throughout the crown. And sometimes it can be hard to tune your eyes into, well, what's thin versus not. But if you look around you and look at maybe some other Western red cedars, that might look a little bit more full. Even in that second picture of flagging, you can see that there's a lot more foliage there than in those the um, trees to the left. And so there's quite a bit of difference um, when you see a comparison between a thinning tree and a non-thinning tree. We also might see flagging, so that's just branch dieback throughout the canopy and a top kill. So just a portion of the top crown that dies. Sometimes the rest of the tree follows suit. Other times the tree may hang in there for a while. And so you just lose the foliage at the top part of the tree. And occasionally we do see some yellowing. Now I wanna make really clear that um, at a certain time of year, typically fall, you will see some sometimes mass dieback 
of older foliage. So that's foliage that's not at the tip of the branch, but on the interior canopy, and it's scattered throughout the crown. And it looks really severe, but this is normal. Trees do not retain their needles forever. They have a limited duration. So after a few years, they will die back. And in Western red cedar, sometimes you'll see a whole bunch die back. So if you do see a whole bunch of orange needles throughout the crown of a tree, typically in fall, and it's the older growth, not the stuff at the tips of the branches, it's probably normal. It's just normal seasonal dieback, and we don't want those things reported. So the first thought people often have when trees are dying is it's got to be insects, right? Um, very rarely are insects the primary cause of tree mortality, especially because a lot of the insects that we typically see in our forest system are native. They're widespread. The trees are used to them. They've developed defenses to with, um, withstand or uh, tolerate any infestation from these insects, or maybe the infestation is at a very low level, not problematic. However, if there are stress conditions in the tree, those defenses are weakened, and then these insects can finish them off. So we do tend to see insects in these dieback pockets, but they're not at the level that would cause tree mortality. They're still at a moderately low level, um, or some sites don't have a lot of incidence of infestation from these insects. So they are not considered a primary cause. Um, in addition, the way that these insects work um, is not one that can overtake a tree, especially if it's healthy. So a common one is bark beetles. There are some wood boring beetles that you see to the right. They can be large and pretty flashy color and they burrow and tunnel through the wood. Um, and so these are very common to see in Western red cedar, even in healthy trees. They're native, widespread, not a problem, but they are secondary. So these insects oftentimes can't even move into a tree unless it's got a high level of stress. So we are not attributing this mortality due to an increase in populations of these insects. Like I said, they are secondary and they often cannot overcome these uh, tree defenses if they are healthy. So a second thought is, well, what about diseases? So again, there aren't a lot of diseases that get into Western red cedar that can kill it. Um, they may um, cause dieback in some portions. So in the heartwood, for example, Western red cedar commonly gets a heartwood rot. Um, but with that being said, this is old tissue that's no longer translocating water and nutrients. And so it's not keeping the tree alive. And that tree is still structurally sound. It still has that sapwood intact. It's still actively translocating water and nutrients. And you can see a fair portion of that interior of the tree that's rotted out and that tree can stand for a very long time. It's very common to see this. So this is not a primary mortality causing agent. There are also different foliar diseases the Western red cedar can get. Um, but again, not primary. They cannot kill a tree. They can reduce growth, stress it a little bit. Um, but typically that's not the case, that they don't build up um, to where they can do that. And Western red cedar is known for being a fairly insect and disease resistant and or tolerant tree. So it is one of those great species we have in our landscape that can resist quite a bit. However, um, Western red cedar is not very drought tolerant. Um, it does not have a very deep tap root it usually has some wider ranging roots in really um, moist or deep, really good soils. They can develop a, a larger root system. So that's not to say it can't have a large root system. It just can't dive really deep for more moisture if they're lacking. And so with that being the case that whenever um, the upper layers of soil are a little drier than usual, that tree can really get dried out. It can't really go a little bit deeper for more moisture. Um, so it's not very drought tolerant. Um, it tends to like shading a little bit more. Um, so whenever we have those conditions changing where it gets warmer or drier, this tree is not very uh, resistant to that. Um, it also does not care for a poor site quality. So poor soils, rocky soils, soils that are high draining, um, it doesn't like its feet sitting in water, but it also needs some moisture to be held in that soil. So um, what we're suspecting, looking at some of these sites and, and the data that I'm about to show you, is that um, drought, ongoing drought, persistent long-term drought especially, is the primary cause stressing these trees, um, leaving them predisposed to any other factors that are out there and that can finish them off. However, drought itself can be a primary and a final factor 
Um, these trees, in addition, have been stressed, as with many of our other species on the landscape in the past several years, by peak temperature events, such as the heat dome. Um, that's stressful, even if it didn't kill a tree, that is a stress factor. And so it's just year after year of dealing with drought and then uh, peak temperature events, um, things like that are really stressing our trees. So what we're seeing in Western red fir is what we're also seeing in true fir, um, another drought tolerant species in some of these sites. It could also be what we're seeing in dug fir, but Western red cedar being one of the least drought tolerant trees can be a canary in the coal mine, letting us know that maybe a site is just too dry for species like that. So the way that drought typically works is that it will kill fine roots and it can collapse vascular tissues, which are the straws that are pulling that water up. So roots will seek out that water, pull it up through the vascular tissues, and that pull is going through the leaves and lost the atmosphere. And the warmer that the atmosphere is, or um, perhaps like the lower moisture content that's being held in the atmosphere, um, it's pulling more moisture from the leaves to offset that um, lack in moisture. And so when you have those conditions, water can move through the tree very quickly and not hang out there as long as the tree would need, even if a tree has enough moisture that it can access and translocate up into the canopy, it may lose that moisture simply too fast. And so the way that trees tend to um, kind of tolerate those conditions are to close up the breathing holes in their leaves because that's where the water loss occurs. And when they do that, they are basically holding their breath and they cannot make food. So they hold their breath, they cannot eat, but they are retaining some moisture. So it is beneficial for that but only for a short period of time. There's only so long that they can do that for before the tree will starve and then some of those tissues end up dying and they can drop them. That's why you might see top kill or thinning throughout the crown. So on the note of drought, um, we should all be aware of it. This past year, we got a little bump in moisture, but it is the third year of a La Nina event, which is a normal cycle that lasts two to three years. Um, we've all heard about El Nino, I think, a um, little hotter or drier conditions, but El La Nina is the opposite of that in this region of the world, that it creates um, conditions that are cooler and more moist, uh, particularly in the wintertime. And so we did experience that in this last year, our final year of La Nina. So um, these trees got a plug of moisture, but that can't undo years and years of drought stress. And as I mentioned, this is the last year of La Nina. We're going back into kind of our drought trends. And what these maps are showing you is within the drought year of 2021 to, um, to 2022, we saw a lot of drought. Those dark red areas are the most extreme drought that we can experience. And so a lot of the state had a lot of stress. And you can see in the Willamette Valley, um, it started out really dry on the left. It got a little bit better um, towards the end of that drought or that water year. However, that's right in the prime area of Western Red Cedar, so they were extremely stressed. And I do want to point you to this email at the bottom um, email list that you can stay on top of drought conditions. So there's a monthly report that's generated that's really nice and concise. It has a lot of great visuals. It breaks it down by region in the state that tells you where we are at in terms of our drought conditions um, and then what the predictions are going forward for the next several weeks. So it's a really great way to keep a pulse on what's actually happening um, on the landscape in terms of drought, because it's really easy to be accustomed to the way that conditions have become and think, well, you know, we had hotter years in the past, but it's not just about these peak records. It's about the timing, the duration, the frequency, the rate of change of the temperature and precipitation. And on the average, what we're seeing in trends is an increase in average temperature and either a decrease or more erratic precipitation levels. And so one of the things that I always like to say is that you can't drink all of the water you need on Monday and call it good the rest of the week. And so trees also need frequent drinks of water, long, slow drinks of water. They can't just take a dump of rain because we had a storm event and then uh, a dry two months especially not during the growing season. And Western red cedar is a unique tree in which anytime it gets a little bit warmer throughout the year, it can start growing again. So it doesn't really have a defined dormancy period. And so it leaves it more exposed, especially when we have drier winters, for example, that um, they're a little bit warmer and they kind of perk up and they might want to grow a little bit more. 
And then um, not having that moisture to support that or uh, those warmer temperatures is going to be all that much more damaging. So next, I'm going to show you a couple of models predicting western red cedar uh, rain shift. And so one thing that I think is a silver lining, although not a great one, I have to admit, um, going forward, when we see dieback of species on our landscape, if we can just adjust our eyes in terms of what species we expect to see occurring where and maybe in what density, we're going to be in much better shape. That if we can shift and maybe expect to see drier species on some of these drier sites and not try to keep forcing the wetter site species, we're going to be in a lot better shape. Um, so what's predicted under a mild climate change scenario um, is that from 2010 on the top left, that was the current in 2010 range of Western Red Cedar and the red is the more concentrated areas of Western Red Cedar and the green is a little bit less dense areas. Um, Going to 2090 under a mild climate change scenario, you can see that the green and especially the red areas have shrunk. So what we might see is either a bit of a rain shift, but more so a rain shrinkage that Western red cedar persists in the cooler um, areas that maybe have more moisture, higher elevation areas, for example. Um, and then under a more extreme model, um, you can see 2010 again, the top left, and then the bottom right um, in 2030, a major change. So a shorter span of time, by 2030, we could see um, quite a reduction in Western Red Deer, especially in Oregon. So um, this is really um, a scary scenario. However, this is the most extreme scenario. That doesn't mean to say that we cannot preserve Western red cedar in Oregon at all. We just have to be very careful about what specific microclimate. So if you are maybe in a drier area, but you do have a more moist draw in that area, by all means, if Western red cedar can persist there, try and plant it there. We don't wanna lose it on our landscape totally. Okay, so diving into our project, um, first we need to determine where is this even occurring? We do fly annual aerial surveys. However, it's really hard to detect Western red cedar dieback, oftentimes because it's underneath the canopy of other trees. Um, it looks very similar to Douglas fir. Um, we have a really hard time identifying that that is definitely Western red cedar dieback. And so we had to do a whole bunch of ground scouting. Um, we also utilized the general public um, in addition to natural resource specialists to kind of do a crowdsourcing of observations to report back to us. Um, and then we try to collect data to try and figure out, are there particular patterns in these landscapes that have dieback relative to the normal range of Western red cedar? So on the left is a survey one, two, three platform that we utilized amongst natural resource specialists that recorded a little bit more in-depth information. Um, often those folks had um, increment bores so they could um, take core samples. So we got a little bit more data out of that. And on the right is the um, version for the general public that's still up and running. It's called Forest Health Watch. And there's a specific Western Red Cedar section that you can continue to submit your reports in Oregon or Washington on this map. And so we definitely encourage you to continue utilizing that resource as well. But um, the natural resource um, specialist project um, that we reported via the survey 123 um, was a cooperative that was funded by the Forest Service and a cooperative amongst personnel from Forest Service, OSU, Oregon Department of Agriculture, um, Oregon Department of Forestry, Washington Department of Natural Resources, um, and a whole lot of other folks that were on board making these reports. Um, collecting data at these sites. Some were just collecting that there is dieback here. Others were more in-depth data collection. Um, <clears throat> at the end of this project, we collected about 369 dieback sites. However, we are continuing to add a few more key sites there, especially if they're outside of the range of um, where we know the dieback is occurring. And then of these sites, at about 147, we collected more in-depth measurements and repeated those measurements um, a second year and we're still holding a few more of those sites for future investigation for other researchers um, that are collecting a little bit more in-depth information, such as a little bit more anal analysis of the um, dendro cores. And our study area was divided into three um, ecoregions. So the western part of Washington, the eastern part of Washington, 
And then all of Oregon, which really was Western Oregon, because that's where most of our Western red cedars are occurring. We divided this up because these are three distinct ecotypes that have a little bit different conditions. And so when we looked at the data, we wanted to make sure that we removed that variable from the data. The things that we collected were a lot of values about the site itself, um, what species are already present, um, what's the slope aspect, elevation, what are the stocking levels of the stand. And then we selected a um, single, single tree that we were going to follow over time. We collected tree age, diameter, uh, where it lies in the crown class, and collected a core sample to count the rings. And then we rated it um, on a scale of low, moderate, or high amount of dieback or transparency. And what we found is that we're, there were definitely some hot spots for where we were seeing Western red cedar dieback. We saw the majority of dieback in marginal sites, which is to be expected. So old agricultural lands that are pretty sun exposed, maybe the soils are of poorer quality for growing trees, especially forest trees. Um, and we often saw a heavy amount of density in areas that are really oak pine dominated habitats. Maybe historically they weren't, but the conditions are moving towards that, or historically they were, and we continue planting Western red cedar in this fringe habitat. We also saw a high concentration of dieback in urban heat islands, so around cities, um, even in the southwest part of Portland, that's kind of the suburbs of the city. Um, there's still a lot of pavement there, not a lot of green spaces, um, maybe not as much moisture availability um, due to being taken by different communities. And so we saw, especially around the Portland area, um, quite a bit of dieback. We saw little to no dieback where Western red cedar occurs in the coast range and the Cascades. We do see dieback of Western red cedar, but we know what the causes are in those areas. It was not drought related. It was often very long-term um, heart rot um, and the trees just failed over time. Um, very old trees. Um, Douglas fir was also struggling at some of these sites. So our eyes on them next, will they be next to fail at especially the most extreme um, drought stress sites? So next we looked at, well, what are some of the patterns that we're noticing at our dieback sites? And so what we did is we compared all the data that we collected at our dieback site relative to a proportion of the Western red cedar known range where it tend to, tended to prefer its habitat. So it's kind of a healthy versus unhealthy site. Um, however, um, there are still dieback areas within the um, distribution of Western red cedar. And so what I want you to look at here is the distribution is the lighter color blue bars, um, and that's where Western red cedar typically occurs. And then where we found the highest amount of unhealthy Western red cedar, that's where we're pulling that information from, and those are the darker bars. And so on average, the dieback that we saw was associated with lower elevation areas. So you can see all those um, blue bars are a lot lower than the light bars. So, um, a lot less uh, elevation gain for those Western red cedar and those dieback sites, likely because they're just not getting um, the cooler temperatures they need. It's a little bit too warm. Sometimes warmer also means drier. We also looked at some ring data and this was very simplified ring data. We do have a partner that is submitting a research project that um, he collected some ring data um, and correlated it with climate patterns and that should be coming out soon. Um, very interesting stuff there, but we collected very base information on how much growth are they putting on in recent years versus previous years. And so what's notable here is that we noted a pattern of far fewer rings um, that uh, were found or faster growth um, in prior years than in recent years. So really scrunched up growth in recent years, not a lot of rings um, or wide rings put on in recent years. And when we cross correlated the unhealthy sites relative to the distribution of Western red cedar, um, we noted that dieback sites, which are on the right side, that cluster of colors on the right side, at each of the dates that we were looking at, um, 
they experience a lower amount of precipitation at the beginning of the growing season, so April, May, June, relative to the sites that have held the normal distribution of western red cedar. And so we looked at comparison for a drought peak year, so 2015 was a big one, as well as compared with the 30-year norm. And the 30-year duration of um, average climate is commonly used in modeling. Right now, the duration is 1990 to 2020. And so when I say 30-year norm, that's what we compared it against. And so you can see that the precipitation experience of the dieback sites to the right, all those bars are lower than their coordinating colors on the left-hand side. So lower precipitation early in the growing season for rest and red cedar at these dieback sites. So these dieback sites um, were not providing enough of the moisture that western red cedar needed. We saw something very similar in terms of higher temperatures. So the dieback sites also experience, on average, higher temperatures um, both in the 2015 years and 2015 year and in the 30 year norm. So the bars are higher to the right at those unhealthy areas. Um, we saw the same thing in moisture deficiency. So it's the difference between evaporation and precipitation. It was also higher. There was a, a higher deficiency um, at those dieback sites relative to the distribution of Western Red Cedar. Um, next, this is a model that um, just to simplify it, it's called a CART model, um, categorical re re regression tree. Um, we wanted to narrow down the list of potential climate or weather variables associated with Western Red Cedar dieback. So we use this categorical regression tree model to select the most important predictive variables. Um, and this prediction is between the distribution and the unhealthy locations, just as we did in our previous correlations. And so where we found the strongest um, correlations uh, were for the west side of Oregon and Washington. Eastern Washington, um, our CARB models didn't really have a strong correlation coefficient, mainly because the eastern part of Washington is a little bit more varied in the landscape. There's quite a bit of elevation range and quite a bit of different kind of ecoregions within that area. And so those um, sites did not play as nicely with our models versus the west side. So a lot of what I'm talking about here is um, from our west side models in this CARB. And for the west side, we found a strong association between dieback and springtime precipitation of snow. And so in this image, what I want to show you is that um, the higher springtime snow-based precipitation is in blue, and then the lower is in brown. And so wherever you see blue, those are areas that experience higher springtime precipitation, and the areas that experience lower springtime precipitation are in brown. And what's in black are our ground verified Western Red Cedar dieback sites, which you can see that more closely aligned with those brown areas. So they're laying right over those areas that experience that lower springtime precipitation. So what we found was that that cart metal was indeed um, showing what we were seeing on the ground. So where do we go from here? It's not really helpful for a lot of the trees um, that we already have on our landscapes that are struggling, that are stressed. You can't really change conditions for them. You can't just turn on a sprinkler and help them out. They need a lot more water than that, more consistent water than that. Um, so you wanna start thinking about, well, what next? What's going to happen in this area next? So preventatively, if you are thinking about planting Western Red Cedar, avoid planting them in hot and or dry sites. They don't like it. Um, they want to be in more moist areas, more shaded areas, high quality soils. They don't like a lot of crowding or competition for moisture. Um, even from under uh, understory vegetation, if you have a lot of blackberry at the site or ivy, um, that's still competition for moisture for these trees. And then at the sites where western red cedar is struggling, um, think about switching to a more drought tolerant species. We don't want to think about how conditions are right now where were conditions 30, 50, 100 years ago versus where they are now, project that forward. Where will they be in 30, 50, 100 years from now through the life of this tree? Gives that tree the best chance for success. And so some options are um, incense cedar, 
sequoia or redwood, um, Willamette Valley pine, white oak. Now these are more of our natives or trees that are found in Oregon and Northern California um, that maybe they should be shifting up into some of these areas. There might be some non-native, non-invasive options as well, but be thinking about more drought tolerant trees wherever you're seeing Western red cedar fail. <clears throat> And increasing invasive species control efforts in these Western red cedar stands was really paramount. A lot of this dieback that I saw, um, particularly in the Oregon Willamette Valley, um, had a lot of blackberry and ivy that were kind of out competing the trees for moisture, even really large trees, they are still competing with them for that moisture. And OSU has this great density table that they've updated looking at climate change and where we're going. Now, it was created in 2018, um, but it was forward thinking in that we need less density, we need more access to moisture, more availability of moisture. So um, I definitely encourage you to be looking at that publication when we're trying to determine what your stocking should be if you're planting a lot of Western red cedar. Now I wanna provide some resources and I'm hoping that this presentation can be, um, the PDF can be provided online so you have access to these links. Um, because we are continuously adding information. So even though the funding for this project has ended, we do still have all of our sites labeled. We are revisiting a small portion of those just to keep a tab on how things are going. Um, and then we are appointing other researchers that are interested in picking up where we left off, diving a little bit deeper um, into what specific site conditions or other climate variables that they can find. Um, we are pointing them um, in the direction of some of those sites. So they already know where the dieback is. Do they have entry? Um, who do they contact for entry? They'll, they'll have that so they can get started that much faster. Um, the dashboard is just cut and dried data from our project, but the story map um, is really where we're gonna be adding more information down the road. It covers everything that I talked about here today in more detail. Um, a lot more data results, um, a lot more guidance is located there, and we will continue adding information as it becomes available. There is also a, also a um, fact sheet, Why Is My Tree Dying? Western Red Cedar Edition. We are publishing more about other species that we're seeing die back, um, so please do check that out. That's on our ODS Forest Health website where we have a lot of information, fact sheets, videos, um, updates on forest health. We have an annual forest health report that we put out that's present there. And then there's that drought uh, status summary email that I mentioned. That's a really good one. That's a really easy way to just keep a pulse on drought. It's just a monthly email, um, just to briefly cover where we at, what are we looking for the next few weeks. And if you do want to report dieback, I am taking some of those areas. Um, however, a lot of the areas that are being reported, we've already covered. So I do encourage you to go to the iNaturalist site and go ahead and put a pin there because they're taking all of the sites and that's going to be an ongoing project. So with that, I'll just open it up for questions. Very good. Thank you, Christine. And uh, so we've got questions in the chat. So I think we just start with those. Um, and if you like, um, I'll, I'll read that aloud just so everyone can see it or hear it if they're not looking at chat. Um, so one question um, from Brandy is, uh, given the amount of dieback we're seeing in the Willamette Valley foothills, is it ever advised to include western red cedar in a planting plant in these areas? I used to plant a lot of western red cedar and grand fir and stand openings or after thinning in the understory. Uh, to increase species diversity and complexity. But now I'm not confident in that choice with both Western Red Cedar and Grand Fur because of the, these issues. Um, maybe it's still a good choice. Do you have any uh, thoughts on you know, that? Yeah. Rather... Yeah, as I mentioned, I don't want to um, just erase Western Red Cedar from our landscape. So I would suggest to plant it only at your best site your sites where you're noticing that other trees that are a little less drought tolerant are doing well there. And I, I'm not talking about Douglas fir. Douglas fir is a moderate drought tolerant tree. Um, so that can do a lot better than Western red cedar at these sites. But if you have true fir that are doing well at these sites, that would be a great Western red cedar site. Any area that's just got a little bit more coverage in terms of shading, maybe gets a little bit more moisture, 
um, definitely encourage it in any coastal areas or higher elevation areas. Um, but in other areas where it's a little questionable and you still want to include it, I would just include it at a lower, lower proportion of the composition of the sand, just because then if you lose a few of them, it's not going to be as detrimental versus losing a whole swath of Western red cedar in one area. You might scatter it in that area. So I don't want to discount it from our planting areas, but if it's a site that just is a little too droughty, you're noticing other trees that are not that drought tolerant, not doing well there, I would not try to force it there. Yeah, and I guess I'll add to that. Obviously, we get this question a lot, and I myself, I'm looking at it right now. I'm at the Hopkins demonstration forest looking at our hillside. And, you know, we have plenty of areas where the cedars are still healthy. And partly what we're trying to figure out is, you know, that microsite or soil or site condition um, and what's going on. And we don't yet have all the answers. So we certainly don't want to just completely eliminate red cedar from our planting plans. Uh, another key aspect is that the establishment of Western red cedar, as many of us are learning, uh, planting a seedling and getting expecting survival or 90% plus success rate with Western red cedar, uh, that just doesn't happen. And even more so now than ever, uh, it really is a lot easier to establish in partially shaded areas or maybe even with artificial shade. So there's that question even just about how to establish it as well as whether or not to plant it. Um, so kind of stay tuned on that. But I think that on certain soil types and conditions, there's still some viable territory for Western Red Cedar, at least under our current conditions. Yeah, and on that note of soil types, um, USGS does put out information on soil types across the state. Now, this is a very coarse map um, in that you can't um, see like where the lines are divided that it's exact that that is exactly where that soil type ends and the other begins but it's a close enough kind of approximation of what soil types are present in your area and in reading um, a background about that they do provide in their guidance on what does each soil type mean um, what's their moisture holding capacity things like that um, pay attention to that, that if you have really good deep soils that have good moisture holding capacity, I'm not talking about clay soils, they do need some porosity, but um, those really good soils, then I would be more encouraged to plant western red cedar there versus in the poorer soil type areas. Yeah, uh, one of the relationships with soils that seems to be holding here and maybe addresses the puzzle of why the cedars are dying in our uh, kind of wet areas is that shallow soils, soils that are shallow with heavy clay or shallow because of a high water table, uh, which has been challenging for Douglas fir in the valley margin, those same situations seem to be a problem for the western red cedar. So even though it may be a wet site in the winter, it actually is causing it to be fairly shallow rooted. And on some of our deeper soils up the side hill, you know, we're seeing cedars that are remaining healthy while the ones down in the bottom uh, on shallow wet soils are the ones that are dying. Okay, uh, there's another question. Actually, this is an interesting one about the mycorrhizal associations and do we know anything about, um, you know, the unique mycorrhizal relationships and those are the fungi that have a symbiotic relationship with plants and help extend the plants ability to absorb moisture and nutrients and western red cedar kind of has a distinct type of mycorrhizal fungi so maybe are there some disconnects where on some sites the, you know, the mycorrhizal fungi with the cedars are not doing well and might be impairing their absorption. Uh, have you heard, heard anything about that, Christine? I have not, and that very well could be a component here. And mycorrhizae um, are, you know, a fascinating topic in science um, that is well understudied. They're very specific. And so you can't just take a scoop of soil from a dug fir and dump it in another dug fir area or dump it in a grand fir area and expect those my mycorrhizae to um, help those trees at that site that you're um, kind of transplanting it into. They're very specific for the species that they're serving and then those conditions um, that can um, increase their specificity too. So it's not as easy as just taking a scoop and dumping it elsewhere as a cure-all. Um, but I have not seen any information about people looking into mycorrhizae specifically with Western red cedar, if there could be some variations there. That would be a great future topic if there was somebody that is studying mycorrhizae that would like to come look at our dieback sites. 
um, and then compare those with the range of western red cedar in areas that are doing well. Is there a difference in mycorrhizae, either the quantities that are present, which I think that's pretty hard to actually ascertain, um, or if there's something with the health of those mycorrhizae. So that very well could be a great future study topic. All right, thank you. Um, another question, uh, if you have a, a cedar that's uh, flagging or you know showing signs of just branches dying, but not the whole tree, uh, did it, would it help to remove the dying branches or just leave them alone? Good question. I would leave them alone. Anytime you clip a tree, um, you are opening up a source that um, uh, you're wounding the tree. And so fungus really needs an entry point. Oftentimes they cannot make their own entry point. They need a wound. They need something that they can colonize into. So anytime you do that, when you clip a tree, a, a sign of a healthy tree is actually where they have immediate sap flow. They have enough moisture cr to create that sap that seals it off and sap is an antimicrobial. And so it's really important that those trees can kind of heal their own wounds. I would not advise using arbor seal or anything like that. You just kind of want to let it ride. If there's some wounds on a tree or pruning, let it heal itself. Um, but I would not advise to remove those branches. It really isn't helping the tree. You may also be removing some active photosynthetic material that could be useful for the tree. So I would say just, it looks like an eyesore, but just let it ride. Do not remove that material. All right, thank you. Uh, Sarah, could you pick up on the questions? Um, I'm gonna fade into the background here because I've got some people entering my meeting room here. Yeah, sure thing. All right, thanks, Christine. We have two more questions right now in the chat. And if anyone has any other questions that come to mind, feel free to add those too. I think we have a little bit of time here. Um, so question from Rebecca. Curious, at the beginning of the webinar, it was mentioned that in high shade and riparian areas, Western red cedar dieback was occurring. Was this in lower lying areas that are more prone to hotter temperatures? And was the river depth reducing in these areas? So I don't know about if the river depth was reducing. Um, however, yeah, a lot of these were low lying areas um, that are just drier um, on average in all the surrounding areas. So I'm assuming that the flood rates, we did look at some uh, stream flows in some of those adjacent areas and they were lower. And so that was just what we were noting that the entire area was really droughted. And so of course those lower lying areas were going to be droughted as well. But yeah, those were all in lower lying areas. So even though um, the question I often get from landowners is, well, there's water right there, but it's not the amount of water that tree has been used to. So even though they're dying along streams where there should be water, is it enough water to support those trees? No, it's different from how much water that they had in volume or consistency for the life of that tree up until now. Great, thanks, Christine. Another question here from Allison. I have seedlings that have started on their own from mature Western red cedar trees. Should I let them be or thin them out? I have nine seedlings in an area of about 20 by 20. You know, being that they're that small, you might just want to let them ride for a little bit longer, but I would start thinning them out when they get to be a size that you can't just clip them off. So maybe when they get uh, to your height or a little bit taller, then you might want to start thinning them out. Um, they're really not pulling up a ton of moisture at that small size. Um, so for now, just let them ride, see which ones are going to do best. Um, as they get a little bit more form, then you can see like which ones have a really nice form versus some may kind of have a little crook in them. Um, some may be damaged by vertebrates down the road and you'll wish you didn't remove so many. So I would say let it ride a little bit longer, maybe until they're um, past the point that you can't just take um, a, a pruner and just clip them from the bottom. Great, uh, a question here related to soil from Nancy. So my floodplain Chehalem loam, may have been okay about 50 to 75 years ago when the Western Red Steeder started growing, but now it dries out too quickly in the summer. Water tables at about six to seven feet in March, but topsoil gets very dry once the rain stops. Is that correct? And so I think if, if I think I'm, I'm understanding your question. So 
yeah, just not having the amount, the volume, or the consistency of moisture that those trees have been used to, that's where the problem lies. The water table may not have changed, but you know, there is still moisture coming um, from you know, the sky into those top soil layers, the very couple of inches where there are roots that are very close to the surface. And so the tree is not only getting moisture from a little bit deeper, but also in the more shallow areas. And especially if you have a lot of, that's why I was mentioning um, invasives like ivy and blackberry that just kind of cover the understory landscape. Um, it may not seem like they're collecting um, or taking more moisture from those trees, but they are the first ones intercepting it when it first lands. It's not even hitting the ground. It may hang out on their leaves um, and they're not absorbing it that way, but it's um, not hitting those upper layers of soil. And so just not having as much moisture either at the depth of the water table and or at those top layers in the soil. So it's just drying out a little too quickly. Yes, that is definitely stressing the tree. Just having water there does not mean it's enough for the tree. It needs to be the same amount of water that it's been used to to grow to the size that it is. Eight. And I think there might have been, sounds like this is also from Nancy that came in, uh, maybe a question on translocating. So she said she had a load of seedlings start on a poor soil surface, about an inch of material. Uh, she potted them and thinking um, she might find them a home. So I think they that might transplant well. <laughs> I will <laughs> say that could be a struggle. Um, if you can find, you know, find them a home elsewhere in your site that might be a little bit more moist or shaded. That would be great, um, but um, good luck getting them to uh, transplant well. Sometimes it's pretty difficult. That's, that's a hard one. Um, yeah, um, and there's actually one more question earlier. Um, regarding drought, does it do any good to spray the leaves of Western Red Cedar as well as watering the soil? I would not waste your time watering the leaves. They're gonna be collecting it up from the roots. And so um, really, you know, that, that helps cool them down a little bit. Um, you know, there's some moisture that gets in some way, but um, they really want it at the root. So I wouldn't waste water. Uh, it evaporates too quickly. Really concentrate on watering the soil. And there is a watering fact sheet on the ODF Forest Health page that if you are going to water, please do read that fact sheet because it's not as simple as I mentioned as turning on a sprinkler. And once you start watering a tree, you're superficially adding moisture that it's not already getting. So if you forget or you decide to stop, you are going to plunge that tree into drought because it, remember, it's the frequency of moisture and how quickly those conditions change that can really shock a tree. So really know what you're signing up for if you're gonna supplement with more moisture. All right, another question came in here. Um, question of, is it okay to leave a few standing dead mature Western red cedar in a stand for wildlife? Or is this a forest health concern or a potential wildfire concern? So it really depends on the site. Um, if the tree is not next to a structure or a busy area with people around like a trail, um, then you, you might want to let it stand, um, but if it's at all a fall risk, and remember, just because the tree dies doesn't mean it's instantly going to fall over. That doesn't mean there isn't something more going on below the surface, that there's a little bit more rot and a, a strong wind might blow it over. That could definitely happen. So that's why I say if it's near a structure or a busy area, you might want to remove it. There is also the option to just top it up to 30 feet if it's already dead. Do not top living trees. We don't want that but topping it up to like 30 feet, maybe a little less, um, just so it doesn't hit um, any busy areas or a structure, because then it can still be utilized as a standing dead tree. Um, a lot of wildlife will use it, in particular woodpeckers. They really like it. The pileated woodpecker makes really big, long holes in the Western red cedar. It's really um, excellent for them for nesting. So if you can let it be, that's great. Um, as for the wildfire concern, when conifers um, are, hold red needles, that's when they have the highest wildfire risk because that stuff burns really quickly. If they're green, then it doesn't burn as quickly. If the needles have all dropped and it's just wood, that's really hard to catch wood on fire. It doesn't have that tinder. And so if all the needles are gone, it's really less of a fire risk. But if it's holding onto those red needles, usually Western red cedar, when it dies, they'll drop them after about a year or so. Um, and if you can get through that period, great. What can help is if it's an area where there is a wildfire concern, but you don't want to cut the tree down, you can prune it up pretty high so that it doesn't create a ladder of fuels going up the tree. 
Um, definitely talk with your OSU Extension agent or ODF Stewardship Forester on a FireWise program if you do plan to leave some dead trees in your landscape and you have concerns about wildfire, they have some additional tips. But if you don't have those other conditions where it's a fall risk or a wildfire concern, then these dead trees are still providing a service on our landscape. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, so for questions in the chat, that's all I'm seeing right now, unless uh, if you wanna take a peek if any of them were sent as a direct message to you. Um, otherwise, if anyone else has any final questions, if you want to type those into the chat right now, uh, we're trying to wrap up around seven, but that still gives us a couple minutes for questions if there's any lingering. This is Nancy. I've already asked kind of my questions and I think arrived at the conclusions. I really appreciate the information. It's extraordinarily helpful in thinking about the long-term future of the, of the uh, land that's in my stewardship. So thank you so much. Thank you. And you know, with the, the last few minutes, um, I do want to just list a personal gripe that drives me crazy. So um, we often will see arborvita um, dying on our landscape. People like to plant it um, as a fence line in their yards. And, um, you know, this can be either, arborvita is either Western red cedar, but there's also an Eastern cedar that is utilized and called arborvita. That's just the cultivar. Um, same thing goes with both of these species. They like moisture, they like shade. They don't like to be planted in a sun exposed lawn. So if you have those trees dying back, don't be surprised. The beetles are finishing them off because they are very thirsty go for a different, more drought tolerant spe uh, species for your yard. Great. Lots of thank yous rolling in with the chat. So thank you so much, Christine. We appreciate you taking the time and this great presentation. So for folks who signed up saying they were interested in some of the other webinars in the series, uh, you're gonna keep hearing reminders from me on each of those Wednesdays. Uh, we'll also send out a link with all of the recordings of the webinars once the series wraps up. Our last webinar is scheduled for uh, August 2nd, so it's every Wednesday. The schedule is in your email. Um, but I'll also send out, uh, Christine provided a PDF of this PowerPoint with all these great resources, so I'll send that out tomorrow morning um, just so you have that in the meanwhile. But yeah, thank you again, everyone, and thank you, Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.